pasas con tu amor, tu gracia me encontró, cambió mi corazón, nada se puede comparar, reinas por la
se mueve aquí En ti está nuestra esperanza Oh gran Dios, oh gran Dios Muévete El cielo cerrado se abre Tu reino se mueve aquí En ti está nuestra esperanza Oh gran Dios, oh gran Dios No hay cielo cerrado se abre Tu reino se mueve aquí En ti está nuestra esperanza Oh gran Dios, oh gran Dios No hay cielo cerrado se abre Tu reino se mueve aquí En ti está nuestra esperanza Oh gran Dios, oh gran Dios Hello, my brothers and sisters in GLC. We just want to take this time to say that we love and we miss you all so much. Although we're going through so much difficult times due to this COVID-19, one thing that we do know is that we are together in prayer. We're together in unity and we just want to advise everybody to continue praying to continue doing what we're doing and that's fighting together so that God could come and heal our land hi my fam we miss you tremendously we're praying with you um, I thank God for pastor who has been encouraging us I thank God for all the brothers and sisters that we all have our own little site for prayer, encouraging words, dance, um, music. Um, let's continue to lift each other up. There's no time for being sad. That's not the way the Lord wants us. He wants us to rejoice because His coming is near. We see all of the prophecies unfolding. His, draw His coming is near and we just want to stay blessed and encouraged and in, in joy. It's not, it's a very difficult situation to say joy, but when you're in the Lord, we have the joy of the Lord and we have to manifest that and not allow the enemy to try to get the best of us because it's very easy listening to the news and all the things that's going on around us. It's very easy to become depressed. No, we rebuke that in Jesus' name. We stay encouraged, lifting each other up in prayer and in the Lord. Listen to music, uplifting music always helps me. That's why I always have the music going on. God bless you, we miss you. Hugs, kisses, love you bunches. To all that needs prayer, Jackie, Hector, we love you, we have you. Sunshine in our prayers last but not least follow-up team I'm so very proud of you keep up the good work keep up fighting keep up the prayers in Jesus name we love you and amen God's peace hi God bless everyone on this beautiful and glorious morning welcome once again to the glory of christ church online service i thank god for everything that he's doing for another day in him to god be all the glory his mercy endures forever as we know nothing catches him by surprise and no matter what we trust him wholeheartedly we are not overtaken by uh, any disease any viruses we do not fear because we know the god we serve we look unto him no matter what uh, he is in control and we continue to be joyful 
we continue to worship him nothing will stop us and we're going forward by the grace of god we just presented him with mornings of powerful worship songs and now we are going to continue to worship him with our tithes and offering please be reminded that the tithes belong to the lord and we give it out of obedience the offerings is out of the goodness of your heart Please be generous. Ask the Holy Spirit to touch and guide you. When the Spirit speak, we listen. Investing in the kingdom is one of the greatest investments you can ever make. Hallelujah. We can never go wrong with that. The Word tells us to be ready in and out of season. Although we are not physically meeting, the work of the kingdom continues no matter what. We may not be physically meeting, but we are connected in spirit. We are united because we are one people. The house of prayer has monthly bills, and we want to thank God that because of your obedience with the tithes and offering, we have a house of worship to come back to when all this is over. We are currently sending our tithes and offering through Venmo, which is a very dependable and safe program available to you. If you need assistance, please reach out to Pastor Raymond through WhatsApp for more information. Now, if with all that said, let's consecrate our tithes and offering and present them before the Lord. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just want to take this time to thank you for everything you're doing. For every person that is giving with a cheerful heart, my Lord God, I ask you to bless them and to guide them. And they never lack anything, Father. Allow us, my Lord God, that with these tithes and offerings, we're able to invest and to plant into your kingdom, into your house of prayer. Father, multiply them, my Lord God, and use them, Father, as you see fit, my Lord. We thank you once again, my Lord God, for everything that you're doing, Father. For you are everything, my Lord God, in Jesus' precious name we pray. If you said this prayer, uh, just agree with me. Amen. I look forward to seeing you um, soon. I miss you so much. I feel like I haven't been uh, together with the brethren so long. I really miss you. We all miss you. And we look forward to this gathering. And I hope and pray it soon. In Jesus' name, I love you. Take care and enjoy the service. bless you this is Jesse um, I just wanted to share a song with you guys that during this time um, just seems right and it's just asking the Holy Spirit to just take control of everything that's happening um, if you're feeling desperate if you're feeling stressed if you're feeling worried just hand it all over to God today and just offer up everything that's within you right now and just sing this song with all your heart I hope that you're blessed Tasted and seen 
all the sweetest and love Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by your presence, Lord Your presence, There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You are living for your presence. Lord. I tasted and see. Of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and set the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Oh.
Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? God's peace, everyone. What you're seeing on the screen right now is a boat, or rather what's left of a boat. It's a very ancient structure that was made back in the first century, 2,000 years ago, and it was discovered by scientists, and they were able to bring it up from the body of water in which it had been buried for all this time. And you see there, they were able to preserve as much as they could of the structure. It's very long, has a unique shape, and if it were to be reconstructed today, it would look like this. Now, our boats look a lot more different than this, obviously, but if you look towards the bottom of the screen, it'll say model of the 2,000 year old boat and that phrase, 2,000 years, should ring a bell for everybody because that was the time of the first century. That was the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we were to be able to go back in time and see this boat as it would have looked to him and to those who were with him, it would have been like this. These boats were the ones that were always out on a specific body of water, fishing and providing the livelihood for many people. And when we're talking about a body of water, that same body of water you see there on the screen, here it is. On your left, you see how it actually looks from the sky looking down. And on the right, you'll see the body of water identified as the Sea of Galilee. And of course, that's in Israel, the Holy Land. And if you look around the sea, you'll see different cities that appear in various stories in the Gospels. Tiberias, Magdala, Genesaret, Capernaum, Chorazin, Bethsaida, all these names here. These are cities that, because they were in proximity to the Sea of Galilee, and basically to one another, you could walk from one to another, this is called the Decapolis, or rather the Ten Cities. And they all, again, were around this Sea of Galilee, which, as I noted before, provided the livelihood for many people and provided nourishment for many people because it was there that fishing took place. And that was there that Jesus called the disciples as they were casting their nets and so forth. Now, in Mark chapter 4, these verses you see here, you'll see that the Lord Jesus is going to do something on this body of water. The, the apostles are going to experience something on this body of water. One of several things that happened to them there. But let's begin with this verse, verse 35, that says, on the same day when evening had come. Now, first of all, the same day, you have to look at the verses prior to this. That's a different story, but you'll see that it was a very busy day. Many things had happened on this particular day. And now when the evening had come, the day was basically over, he, the Lord Jesus, said to them, the disciples, let us cross over to the other side. And you saw the body of water, you saw how big it was from one end to the other. It was a nice little journey right there. So it was evening, they began to cross over. The Bible says they left the multitude, the people that had been with Jesus throughout the day, and they, the, the disciples, the apostles, took him along in the boat as he was. He got right in the boat with him. And notice it says, and other little boats were also with him. So it wasn't just one boat, as we are accustomed to hearing. It was, it was several. But we're not sure if the other little boats were actually still with him when what happened next took place. What we're told in Scripture is that while they were crossing over, 
a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling now storms on the sea of galilee are not unusual they tend to happen spontaneously without any prior warning excuse me and this is what happened in this case and it says not just a windstorm but a great windstorm so much so that the water was piling into the boat causing it to practically sink i need you to see that picture in your mind winds blowing it's nighttime it's dark the only light that they have are the lights of the stars above them if, if the moon was out then the light of the moon as well in other words it was a very dark night if anybody's ever gone on a cruise you'll know that out there in the open sea it is pitch black you can see practically nothing and, and you, but when you look up you can see the stars very bright but not bright enough to make a real difference because you're basically surrounded by darkness so here we have the disciples are in a boat the wind storm arises it's pitch black they can't see the horizon they can't see their destination and now the waves are pouring into the ship and they're doing their best to get the water out because many of them had been experienced fishermen as we know but now this has gotten so bad that apparently no matter how much they were trying the water was still coming in and we know that if water gets into a boat sufficiently the boat will sink so what do they do they turn to the one who is with them they turn to jesus christ who's in the boat with them and what happens next is what you and i all of us are going to consider and study and learn from for all our sakes today because here it says that jesus was in the stern at the opposite end of the boat asleep on a pillow now we have to understand he wasn't in a place that was covered in some movies you see him in a covered like a little a little room that has a has a roof and and the water wasn't hitting him he was all protected and dry that is not the case if you look at the back at the boat that i showed you in the beginning it didn't have a little roof everybody was exposed to the elements so jesus is lying down in the boat asleep on a pillow now we need to stop here this tells us so many things first of all jesus is the son of god we know that was god is god always will be god however he was also is also and always will be the son of man he was one of us and as i said it was a very long day and he was tired and he fell asleep because he was in a human body please keep that in mind because he was in a human body jesus was subject to the same stresses to the same circumstances physical circumstances that all of us are we read in the bible that he was hungry that he was thirsty he was indeed son of man son of mankind son of humanity one of us and here's a great example of it and just how tired was he well water was coming into the boat the boat was i'm sure turning up and down riding the waves but he's sleeping and none of that woke him up at all. When I was a kid, a young boy, my father used to warn me to get up early or he would pour water on my face. And I've shared this in church several times because he didn't want me to be lazy. So at a certain age, I, I would say about the age of seven to eight, dad began to tell me, well, you have to start getting up because you know, you're getting older now, you have things to do in the house and so forth. And he would tell me, set the alarm for 8 o'clock, just to get me trained. Later on, I learned to get up at 6, actually. But uh, my first few days, I put the alarm, and I was able to, in, in my sleep, reach up and turn it off. It was a little button you pressed, and that was it. There was no snooze that back in those days. It was either on or off. So I had the alarm at the at, right near my bed, and I just reached out and turned it off on several occasions. And Dad would come in and find me sleeping and wake me up and, and tell me get up and i would sometimes turn over and not want to listen to him and he began to warn me if you don't get up i'm going to throw water on your head and i thought he was just making believe but i'm saying what father would do that to his son you know i'm so comfortable why would he do that not being able to see that he had a greater reason a greater purpose in mind 
not to allow me to get lazy in life. And he was a firm believer in that saying that the early bird gets the worm. In Spanish, they say it's still more differently. El que madruga, Dios lo ayuda. That's the same concept, that it's good to get up with the sun. So because I didn't listen to him, one day he came and stood over my bed, as you all know, and he held a cup of water right over me and told me, you turned off the alarm again, it's time to get up. And I ignored him, and he began to pour the water on my head. First one drop, then another, and then several drops. And the very shock of the water hitting my body caused me to get up. And from that day forward, he says, and every day I'm going to do the same until you get up and learn. And because he taught me this, to this very day, getting up early is not a problem for me. And it's true. It's a very good adage, a good proverb, as they say. Getting up early gives you a great start to the day. Now, of course, if you work at night, we're talking a different story altogether. But normally people work during the day. And this is a good lesson for me to learn. But I'm using it as an example because it only took a few drops of water to get me up and to wake me up. And he would have poured the whole thing on my head had I not, you know, cooperated with him. But here we see Jesus lying in the boat, sleeping on the pillow. Water is pouring all over him. Not just a few drops on his head. We're talking about water pouring on his, on his body. And he is sound asleep. Now, this tells us a couple of things. First and foremost, he was human, as I said. Secondly, he was really tired. So that the water itself couldn't wake him. But it also tells us something else. It also tells us, shows us, demonstrates for us just how sure and secure Jesus was. There's a phrase in the Bible where when he was in danger in certain times, it says, his time had not yet come. And he knew that nothing could happen to him until the time came. The time, of course, when he would give his life for us. So on every occasion that there was apparent danger, he had no fear because his time had not yet come. So here we see that happening. He's asleep profoundly because he knows that no storm is going to kill him. He has a job to fulfill. He has a life to give his life for the life of the world. If you don't know Jesus Christ, he died for you and he lives again for you today. And you can know him as your Lord and Savior because he came to do this. He came to die for us, then to resurrect us, resurrect for us, and to conquer death. In this case, that time had not yet come. Now, the apostles don't understand what's going on because they must be asking themselves, how can this man sleep throughout this storm? And next, the question that arises in their hearts, you see it right there on the screen. And notice how they instantly jumped to conclusions. They instantly judged the Lord. They literally judged him. Because instead of going to him and just taking him awake or saying, Lord, excuse us, we need your help with respect, they're so panicked. And what they're seeing makes no sense to the, to the degree that they look at him and they think he doesn't care. Why would they think that? Because he wasn't doing anything. He was resting, he was sleeping, he was sound, sound asleep, and they thought that that demonstrated that he didn't care. Because we hear them say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you can see how the apostles' hearts were filled with judgment. They looked at the Lord and they resented him. What are you doing? Why aren't you getting up? Why didn't you already stop this? Why are you letting us go through this? They had no understanding of it. To them, everything had to be comfortable. Everything had to be easy. This is the Messiah. He should have gotten up before there was ever a storm. He should have stopped the storm from happening. Now that it started, he should have already gotten up and stopped this thing. He should have saved us. He should have done something. Whatever. They weren't even sure what he could do because when he does what he does later, they're in awe. But they knew he could do something because they're waking him up and saying, don't you care that we are perishing? So they were upset at him because to their understanding, he was doing nothing. We have the blessing of being able to look back to this time and realize that yes, indeed, he was doing something. Just because the Lord is not moving the way we want him to, that doesn't mean he's not doing anything. In this case, this was a test 
for the apostles. It was an opportunity. I like the word opportunity better. The word test carries a negative connotation. People hear test and they think that they're being put on trial and whatnot to remain fun of. Not at all. God gives us opportunities to put our confidence in him into practice to show how much we trust him. He already knows how much we trust him or not. We're the ones that don't. Many people think they trust God, but when things get tough, they fall apart, just as the apostles did here in the midst of the storm. So Jesus was allowing them to go through this. He did not deliver them from going through the storm. In fact, he didn't even get up to address the situation at all. He let them go through it. In other narrations of the story, the Bible tells us that the apostles worked hard to try to get the water out. They were working hard to save the ship. They were doing everything within their power to no avail. The storm was just too great. But they wanted Jesus to get up and do something. And they were they were angry. The word is angry, frustrated, upset, whatever you know, description you want to give it. They weren't happy. They expected more from him. See, all of us have an expectation of God, have a picture of God, and have a, a thought of how God will do, should do, must do on our behalf. None of us like to be uncomfortable. None of us like to be in danger. None of us like to be in any circumstance that is not the absolute pinnacle of easy living. And the minute something rocks our boat, to use an example from this story, instantly we get upset, instantly we ask questions, oh, why is this happening to me? I've heard people actually say, well, why does God let this happen? I'm faithful, I go to church, I give my tithes, I'm in service, I give, I work for the kingdom. Why does he let me go through whatever it is they're going through at the moment? And I'm not trying to put anybody down because when we go through troubles, the troubles seem huge to us. Other people may look at us and go, that's all, you, that's all you're dealing with? That's nothing. I always consider what our brothers and sisters are going through in other parts of the world where they're giving their lives, where they're being tortured, imprisoned, killed for the sake of the gospel. They would surely look at some of our so-called problems and say, what are you concerned about? What are you worried about? You want to trade places? I mean, it's, it's just the truth. But to every person, the troubles seem to be huge. And human nature takes, of, takes over and leads us into a, a state of panic, a state of fear, or a state of confusion. And I hate, brothers and sisters, I hate the word confusion. Confusion means that your mind is not at peace, at rest. Your mind is wandering. Your, and honestly, the word confusion will lead you to a worse state. It will lead you to a state of, sometimes in some people it's paralysis. They, they, they just stop, they don't care. Other people, they, go, they get hyperventilated. I mean, there's so many different reactions. But the disciples are here, they're very confused. They're very upset. They really thought that Jesus, well, he didn't care. Who knows, perhaps one of them may have thought, are we following the right guy? I mean, he can heal the sick and all that. But look at us now. What can he do to help us in this situation? Maybe there's a limit as to how far he can help us. And that's why he's not doing anything. Maybe he can't. Again, the judgments that our minds create, the opinions, the thoughts. The Bible clearly tells us that God speaks and says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. And yet we always think that our thoughts are somehow the best. That our thoughts are, actually we never say this. But the way we act, we act as if our thoughts were infallible, that we can't make a mistake, that, oh, this is logical, especially those of us who rely heavily on logic. God loves to take those people and put them into situations where logic means absolutely nothing, where logic is overturned on its head, because it is at that point when you no longer have the anchor of logic to hold on to. Let's see what you're made of now. What's happening doesn't make sense. This story, the apostles saying, this doesn't make any sense. We're with the Son of God. Why should we be going through a storm? Well, it's because of that same reason you're going through a storm. Because you are with the Son of God and there are forces that want to destroy you 
for that you will not take this message of the Son of God, of the life that the Son of God can give those who trust him. The devil doesn't want you to take that to anybody. He'd rather see you dead before you become a living witness of what God can do. So what does he do? The devil doesn't show up to us in full form. Not really. Once in a while he'll try that. But it's very rare. He'll just throw what the Bible calls the flaming arrows. And those arrows of fire land always, first and foremost, in our minds. Oh, I don't understand. How many times have I heard that in my Christian life? Oh, Lord, I can't even begin to count how many people have said, I don't understand. In fact, brothers and sisters, I myself have, have said that on many an occasion where I've gone before the Lord. Father, I don't get it. I don't understand this. What is going on? It doesn't make sense. And that's correct. There are times that God lets us go through moments where things just don't look logical sensible in fact they look ridiculous sometimes they look foolish sometimes and yet the bible says that god uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise understand that lesson my brothers and sisters it's a powerful one what we're being taught by the word is that god doesn't want us to approach him using our human logic all the time yes there are times we can in isaiah god says come let us reason together though your sins be as scarlet they shall be white as snow so there are times when you we can use what we call these days common sense and realize that you know we're supposed to do things better and approach god and repent for sins and work our lives and so forth there are times but most of the time i find that our human logic doesn't help much when dealing with supernatural things because remember we're citizens of two worlds we're citizens here in this world whether it be of the united states and or other countries we're part of the physical material world we live in a world you are in the world. The Bible even says so. You are in the world. But then it goes on to add, you're not of it. You're not of this world. We're of a different world. We're, as Peter calls us, we are pilgrims passing through, strangers passing through this world. And because of it, we're called to have a different mindset, to think differently. Our human brain says, but why? I don't get it. But that's when our spirit, we are spirits. That is when we need to tell our human minds, calm down doesn't make sense but God is in control it doesn't sound logical but the Lord Almighty has never left us and will never leave nor forsake us you see this is how we deal with ourselves this is how we speak to ourselves in the Bible we find that in the Psalms where David says to himself why are you cast down O my soul he's speaking to his mind his soul why are you cast down why are you troubled why are you worried why are you upset trust in God for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God we need to speak to, to ourselves and remind ourselves that Almighty God has not left us. He is with us. And the promise is that if He lets us go through a storm, He will be with us. If He lets us go through the fire, He will be with us. And it's His presence that makes all the difference. That's how He wants us to think. That's how He wants us to live. Certain times, human logic, yes. Most of the time, no. It's when things don't make sense that our faith can actually grow, which is why he gives us the opportunity to allow faith to grow. Because if he took care of everything for us and let nothing ever happen to us, nothing adverse, nothing difficult, we would be absolutely immobile. Imagine a mother or a father who takes their child and never lets the child walk. Leave him in the crib. No, he's safe in the crib. Just pick him up, feed him, put him down. Pick him up, feed him, put him down. All his life. And when the child wants to walk, they'll say, no, don't walk. Just stay lying down. That way we can keep an eye on you. What kind of person would that become? An invalid. No, there comes a time where you have to stand the child up on his or her legs. And yes, the first time walking, they will stumble. Yes, the legs have to get used to being exercised and utilized. But eventually that child learns to walk and then eventually the child learns to run and to climb and to be all that god created that child to be so that's how we are in spirit god in the beginning as babes in christ yes we go through times the bible even says that everyone god receives as a, as, a, as a son or a daughter he chastises them he lets them go through things but it's only in a measured amount according to how much we can endure 
babies can only hold so much pressure. It's the older you get that the pressure gets stronger because your muscles grow the more pressure you exert. That's the whole idea of weightlifting. When you lift weights, how wide do the muscles grow? Because you're pushing against a greater weight. And in that push, in that exertion, your muscles grow. So in this case, the Lord was allowing the spiritual muscles of the disciples a chance to grow for them to see the wind and the waves and for them to realize we're here with the Son of God. We're not going to perish. And to reach out to Him, not in judgment, not in fear, but rather in confidence. Lord, we're going through a hard time here. We're concerned. Concern is one thing. Fear is another. They were terrified. And what Jesus wanted of them was for them to come to Him in a confidence that only can come from a heart filled with faith to say, Lord, we need your help. And well, they didn't do that. They failed this test because they accused him of not caring. So what happens? Remember always that other people have gone through this. The psalmists were going through difficult times and they expressed themselves just like the apostles did. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? This is there to show you that human nature jumps to conclusions. It just does. I'm not saying it's a right thing. What we're seeing here is human beings not knowing how to make sense of something that's happening and coming to God and thinking that God is far away or that God is hiding himself. This next one is even more direct because here the psalmist actually says to the Lord, Awake! Why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise! It sounds like identical to what's happening to the apostles. Why do you sleep? At least this here, it doesn't say, and you don't care. The apostles took it one step further and, and accused the Lord. You don't care. Don't you care? Well, the psalmist says to the Lord, Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise. Then he adds, Do not cast us off forever. He felt abandoned. He felt that God had abandoned his people. He, and he, he prays and says, Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? Well, I got news for all of us. First of all, God doesn't sleep. The same psalmist later on would be inspired by the Holy Spirit to say, He that keeps Israel, his people, shall neither slumber nor sleep. So God does not sleep. What you're seeing here is not a theological statement that Almighty God takes naps. No, this is not that. This is human beings trying to make sense of trouble and thinking as human beings tend to think, all right, it must be that God is, God is asleep or God has cast us off. Or God is hiding his face. God has forgotten about. Everything is a negative opinion about God. Because that's human nature. We tend to think the worst. Believe the worst. Act the worst. Follow through on the worst. It's because of human nature being infected by the power of sin. And as the Bible calls it, our earthly way of thinking. James calls it earthly wisdom. It's sensual it's worldly it's it actually it's devilish it's bad we tend to think bad even the most optimistic among us sometimes gives in to this negative mindset and we tend to think as the apostles think that god doesn't care or as the psalmists think that god was awake or went away and turned away from us and so forth but never never must we allow ourselves to think that that's the case our minds may think that, our, we, our emotions may, may feel that, but the Bible promises that God says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and that God says in Him all things are possible, and that He works everything together for good. It is our choice to think that way, and then to believe that, and if we believe it, we'll live it. Because again, James tells us faith without works is dead. If we really trust that God is in control, if we really trust that everything that happens, He will work together for good, if we really trust that all these promises in Scripture are true, we will step up from this kind of cry, Lord, you're sleeping, Lord, you forgot us, Lord, you don't care. We'll stop all that negativity, which does nothing but destroy our faith and do what Jesus had expected the apostles to do. How do we know what He expected them to do well? Because here we find what He did. The Lord gets up, and he, according to Mark chapter 4, he arose and rebuked the wind. 
and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the result, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, did the Lord expect the apostles to know enough to get up and, and tell the wind and waves to stop? No. How do we know this? Because later on, the Apostle Paul would suffer shipwreck several times. In fact, there are several chapters in the book of Acts that talk about him being imprisoned, being sent to Rome, and on the way to Rome, we find him in a shipwreck in the middle of a terrible storm. And that storm was even worse than this one because that ship that Paul was in was going from the Holy Land to Rome, crossing the Mediterranean Sea. It was a, it was a much bigger body of water. And if you read in the book of Acts about this shipwreck, you'll see that before the ship was wrecked, people give up hope of living. And the Apostle Paul gets up and says, the Lord has spoken to me that we're not going to die, we're going to be cast on an, on, an, on an island. But he doesn't say, like Jesus did here, to the storm, be still. He doesn't. That wasn't what the apostles were called to do. That wasn't what Paul did. Paul got up and did what we're all supposed to do. See, in Paul's case, an angel had appeared and promised him that nobody would die. Paul had the word of the Lord that nobody would die. And I've shared this before. And Paul gets up in the middle of the storm and he proclaims the word of God and says, I believe that what I was told is true. No one shall perish. So first thing we need to do when we're in a storm is remind ourselves or learn if we haven't learned them of the promises of God and quote those promises and believe those promises and say like Paul, I believe that it shall be even as it was told to me. Now in that story also, we find Paul telling the captain of the ship about a plot that the seamen of the ship had hatched. After Paul said those words of faith, some of the sailors wanted to get into the escape boats and leave. And Paul tells the captain, if they leave, none of us will survive. So that tells us the other side of the story. God's promises are, for the grand portion of them, dependent on us as well. God works with us. Very rarely does God do everything and we do nothing. Very, very rarely. We work together with God. He calls us to believe so we can see his glory. So that, that storm that Paul went through, we learn that the promise of God would come to pass if everybody did their part. So when we're in a storm and we feel the boat shaking and moving, yes, proclaim the promises of God and believe the promises of God by showing peace in the midst of the storm. Look at Jesus' words. Peace. Be still. You're in a storm now, whether because of the virus or other issues or a combination of the above. Peace. Be still and trust in the Lord. He knows what he's doing. However, you have a part to play. You do. In Paul's case, as I said, the sailors had to stay in the ship for the promise of God to come to pass. And now, in this case, we see that the apostles should have done something. Because after Jesus rebukes the storm, everything returns to normal. Jesus turns to the disciples and he asks them these two questions. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? See, sometimes he would tell them, oh, ye of little, of little faith. In this case, he goes, you got none. And other narrations add the words, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? So the faith that they did have went out the window because of circumstances. And notice Jesus doesn't say, I understand, you know, things are hard. I know you were scared. It's okay, I'm here. He does not paternalize us that way. He doesn't baby us. He fully expected them, based on these questions, A, not to be fearful. Because he asked them, why are you? They shouldn't have been afraid. To be concerned, yes. To be trying to get the water out of the boat, yes. But not to be terrified. But they were. And they get themselves a rebuke here when Jesus asks them that question. And then he, he identifies where their fear came from. They were fearful because they had no faith. No confidence. That's the word, what the word faith means. Remember, I shared about that earlier this week. Faith is confidence. They did not confide in God, trust in God, have an immovable assurance that God, despite the storm, was in control.
And Jesus rebukes them for that. How is it that you have no faith? How is it that we, knowing the Word, filled with the Holy Spirit, having seen God do many things, both in our lives and in the lives of others, how is it that when things get bad, our faith goes out the window? Not everybody, thank God, many people keep their faith. Many people express their concern to the Lord. They go before the Lord. They weep and wail and cry out to God. That's fine. But they don't do so with a spirit of fear. I'm not saying a demon. When I say a spirit of, I'm not talking about demons, please. Your spirit, our spirit, can become a spirit of fear. If we let those fearful thoughts sink into our hearts, our spirits will be contaminated with fear. That's why many times you'll see in the Bible where Jesus tells people, don't be afraid, just trust. The minute we let terror into our minds, it infects us. And if you take a quick look, it says that they feared exceedingly. Not just feared, even after the storm was over, they were still afraid. Even though the, the danger was gone, now they're scared of something else. Now they're scared of Jesus. Like, who is this guy? Apparently, they didn't expect him to have that amount of power. Who knows what they were expecting? They were expecting something. When they woke him up, don't you care? Perhaps they were expecting him to transport them supernaturally across the water. In fact, we have an example of that in the Bible where he does do just that. That he get he just makes them go from one end to the other in an instant of time. Maybe they were expecting that. We don't know exactly what each apostle was expecting. All we know is they wanted him to do something. But then when he does this, commands the storms to cease, and everything stops immediately, now they're terrified of him. Like, who is this man? Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So again, they continued pressing in on living in fear. But if you take a quick look at this picture, those aren't the apostles. I picked this this particular drawing for a reason. Because that would have been Peter, James, John, all the apostles. But the artist here, he didn't draw the apostles. He drew us. We're in that boat. All these different nationalities, male, female, that represents us, especially now. We don't know when this virus is going to be gone. We don't know when this time is going to be over. We don't know when we're going to be in the church building again. We have no idea. We're in a storm. The boat is rocking. The winds are, are, are blowing. The water is belting into the boat. Are we like these people here? If you look at, take a good look. Some of them... Well, they all look concerned, but some look terrified, and others, despite their concern, look confident. Take a quick look at how the, the, the artists do the faces. The person on the bottom left-hand side, she has her hands raised up. She's confident. The gentleman between her and the other man looks scared, but he's, he's interested. What, what is God going to do? The one holding on to the, to the mast looks terrified. The man underneath him is in awe of the power of God. The lady next to him is saying, oh, this is great, but this is scary. And you can go to the other side of the picture. And the other lady seems to be the same way. Like, wow, this is awesome, but this is scary. The guy over there underneath her says, I don't know what's going on. And the, one, the lady at the very end of the right-hand side of the screen says, okay, let me try to make sense of all this. So many different reactions, and it represents our reactions at this time and other times as well. We all have these human reactions. But Jesus expects of us even more than what he expected of the apostles. Because the apostles, he himself said to them that the Holy Spirit was with them and would be in them. Notice it was still future. The Holy Spirit came into the apostles on the day of Pentecost. But even though the Holy Spirit was not yet in them at the time, the Lord Jesus rebukes them for their fear, for not having confidence that he was able to deliver them, even if it didn't happen the way they wanted it to. That he was in control, even though he wasn't doing what they wanted him to. How much more us, that are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the power of the living God, and have all these blessings that the apostles only received after Pentecost. And they didn't have them when Jesus was with them here on earth, physically. But how much more do we have the power to trust God, to be in the boat as it goes through the storm, but to come to him, to him who alone can tell the storm, cease, however he chooses to do it. Whether, the, whether there's a vaccine developed for this virus, 
whether the virus disappears, whatever happens, we don't know, and that's not our concern. Our concern is to come to Jesus and say, Lord, help, and then to wait on him. He knows what he's doing. Even Jesus had said that to the apostles. He goes, and on one occasion, he goes, what I'm doing now, you don't understand, but you will later. That's where faith comes in. That's what confidence is. I don't know what he's doing or why, or why he's rather allowing this to happen, but I trust him. Just like Job, when he was filled with all the sicknesses and had so many losses, and his wife tells him, stop already, just curse God and die. Job says, no, though he slay me, though he kills me, I will trust in him. I pray that all of us, by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, will say that today. We don't understand why is it some of our brothers and sisters have been infected? Why is it that Christians around the world are experiencing the same thing we are? Some Christians have even died. I shared that testimony this week of the pastor who perished because of COVID, because of the virus. But look how he went out proclaiming Christ in the midst of an atheistic environment. Doctors who themselves were completely panicked and afraid, and he was able to tell them, I'm not. I know where I'm going. And he passed away. And the way he lived and the way he died caused those atheist doctors to put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. I want you, I want you to see something as we close. Today. All those verses, look at how many there are. And there's many more where those came from. I wasn't going to fill the screen with verses, but I want to give you a taste. In every one of those verses, we have that phrase, fear not. And in Psalm 27, as I draw the message to a conclusion today, the psalmist says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom? Oh, what a question to ask. The answer is nobody. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of nobody. Why? Because we have a promise. And here I'll with this psalm 91 there's a promise it says you shall not be afraid of please understand this carefully you shall not be afraid of what terror the terror by night you shall not be afraid of the arrow that flies by day violence and bad things that can happen to us you will not be afraid of it you will not be afraid of the pestilence that's what we're dealing with now pestilence plague that walks in darkness the virus is walking in darkness. We don't know where, where actually it is. We're washing our hands and being so careful. We don't know where that person is. It's in darkness. It's walking in darkness. It's, it's covered the whole world. And yet the Bible says, you shall not be afraid of it. And you shall not be afraid of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Why? We'll talk about that in our next time together because the psalm that we're reading here proclaims that this is the promise God gives to those who have confidence, trust in the Lord. And we'll talk about that in our next message. But remember, Jesus asked, why are you afraid? Why don't you have any faith? May that not be the case for us. May he tell us, I'm proud of you. Because despite the storm, yes, you were concerned, that's normal. But you refuse to give in to fear. The promise that God says here is that, when we trust in him, we can dominate our fears. You will not be afraid. It isn't that we're not going to get exposed to these things. That's not the promise. It doesn't say here, oh, terror will never come to you. Oh, the arrows will never come to you. They'll never be. It doesn't say that. The promise here is that we won't be afraid of those things. We have power over the fear. And when fear is out, faith flourishes. And when faith flourishes, God works wonders, whether to deliver us from a problem or to deliver us through a problem but he will indeed deliver us and the world will see and know that god is real that christ is real that the message of the gospel that we share is real and you will have been an ambassador i will have been we will be ambassadors of the gospel of jesus christ as we stand together now in our places i'm going to ask you to join me in prayer because first and foremost as i said this message is for those that know Jesus Christ, that have been filled with the Spirit of God, that have given their hearts to Christ. Are you in a storm right now? We all are. The whole city, the whole world is in a terrible storm. Are you afraid? So many people are terrified. But I have news for you. Christ Jesus is with us. And he wants to be more than that in you. He wants to be in you. But for that, 
You have to ask him in. He will not force his way in. He knocks on the door and he wants you to invite him in. And if you today do not know Christ, or if you fell away from Christ, you're backslidden, what a day to come to Christ now so he can work this storm out and all other storms you may go through in life. Work it all out for good according to his promise. So right now, if you have not known the Lord or are away from the Lord, I ask you to bow your head where you are and close your eyes with me. And the church who's listening and participating, join me because this word is going out all over. And may it touch many lives. But let's believe those of you who need to come to Christ with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, please say this prayer with me. Say, Dear God, I recognize that I have sinned against you. I'm sorry for my sins. I turn away from my sins and I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. And with the help of of the Holy Spirit, I will follow you in confidence and serve you in confidence because you'll never leave me and you'll never forsake me all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord. The blood of Jesus has washed away my sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You just prayed that prayer. Congratulations. And the promise of God's word, Jesus Christ has received you and you're part of his family now. I'm going to ask you please to call the following number. The number is 646-266-1907. Again, I'll repeat it for you. The number is 646-266-1907. That's the number for the follow-up team, the person who works with me, Angel Melendez, our dear brother, who is there to receive your call. The Bible says that if you receive Christ, you must let the world know. Whoever acknowledges me, Jesus said, before people, I will acknowledge you before the Father who is in heaven. So right now, call that number again, 646-266-1907, and let angel know that you've come to know Jesus Christ. If you're a a lady, a sister, a woman, I'm going to ask you to call anyway because Angel's wife, Emily, will be there and she will minister to you and she will tell you what's going to happen next. The same same way Angel will do so with the men who call. We're here to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So by all means, call. Congregation, rejoice with me because today and every time this message is shared, people will come to Christ, will be reconciled with Christ. And I pray now as I close this message, that you and I, who know the Lord, will trust him. Not be afraid. Concerned? Yes. But concern is just a mild sense of, okay, what do I do here? Not terror. Concern. And the concern takes us to God and fuels us in our prayer, motivates us to call upon the name of the Lord, but to call upon him with the confidence that he will work it all together for good, and that whatever purpose he has on allowing things to happen and not intervening directly at the moment, he knows what he's doing. Can you turn to him and say, Lord, I trust you. Right where you are, look up to the heavens. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I will not be afraid. You said it in your word. I believe it in my heart. And that settles it forever. Amen. Blessed be his name now and always. Peace and joy be with you this day. Remember, concern is one thing, fear is another. We're concerned for the well-being of everyone, and we're praying for the well-being of everyone. But don't be afraid. God is in control. Please be watching WhatsApp. I'm going to be sending out more announcements and more modifications and trying to find a way to communicate with you visually, live, if we possibly can. I'm still working on it through an an app called Zoom. Once I get it up and running and and functional, I'll definitely send out the notification. But in the meantime, may God's grace be with you. Father, I pray your protection, your mercy, your blessing be upon everyone who's watching 
this video, who's been partaking of our service today, your service, for your glory, for your honor, and for the blessing and benefit of our hearts. Take us now with your blessing and protection as we dismiss until Tuesday when we share again in your praise and in your word. And may the day come quickly that we, that we are all together again in your house of prayer. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God's peace and grace. Love you and miss you with all my heart.